Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let's give a big hand for Jesus. He's worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We bless your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, indeed, we have a mutual friend in uh, Peter Pretorius, who is well known to you. Um, it's my first visit here to Richmond. It is kind of an introductory visit, and I would like to tell you something about the background of our ministry and about that what Jesus Christ is doing today. Amen? And I'm sure that all of you who have a burden for souls to be saved, you will have many hallelujahs in your heart. To God be the glory. Amen. Well, um, let me first give a little report about how this ministry started. I like to do that all the time because I pray that the Holy Spirit may just, you know, touch many hearts with the same Holy Ghost impulses that touched me many years ago and that kicked me into gear. And after that, I have a short message on my heart and I believe with all my heart that the power of God is going to shake, is going to shake this church here tonight. Amen. You know, when I was a missionary in Africa, the first few years, one day I woke up and it all of a sudden struck me. I'd never heard anybody talk like that, but all of a sudden it struck me when I read what Jesus said. I, I said, well, I think I'm just playing marbles. Whereas God told me to move mountains. And I said, Lord, I'm sick and tired of playing marbles. Because when I play marbles, the mountains are mocking me. And I stopped playing marbles forthwith. And I tell you, we are moving mountains in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. My wife and I, we left Germany in 1967. That's exactly 25 years ago. We are already grandparents. You know, they say that the most dangerous thing, the two most dangerous thing for a baby are scissors and grandparents. <laughs> 25 years ago, we left for Africa. God had given us a clear call to go and preach the gospel in that continent. For seven years, we lived in a small country called Lesotho in southern Africa, in the capital town, I should say, because it was so small, called Maseru. The whole country only had a population of one million. And those years were years of struggle for me, outright struggle. I preached, I preached, I preached, I prayed, we fasted, I preached and I saw some people saved here, some people saved there. I will never forget, sometimes I traveled half a day first by car and then I had to park the car and then on donkey back and then on foot and then by boat and then I reached that mud, mud uh, church, you know, that church building made of mud and I found five people there to preach to. And I said, oh God, why did you send me to Africa to preach to five people? And I figured it out. If I had to reach Africa preaching to five people at the time, the population of Africa would have to do me the favor and stay alive for 5,000 years until I had made my round. And then I realized this can't be it. God must have something else in mind. And I was crying to God and then the Lord laid on my heart to start a Bible correspondence course. 
just an evangelistic Bible course. And one, two, three, I had 50,000 enrollments. I opened an office, offices. The letters were coming in in floods, correcting lessons, correcting lessons. Leading people to the Lord. It was as if I, I thought that time, I thought I had been, you know, uh, uh, diving in a submarine in an ocean of humanity and now I just through the periscope all of a sudden I looked and I saw I was diving in an ocean of people who were willing to be saved amen and then God began to change direction of my life all together and it happened one night I had a dream it wasn't a dream it was a vision I saw the continent of Africa the whole continent including the islands and I saw how the continent of Africa became washed in the blood of Jesus. And I heard the Holy Spirit say in that dream words that penetrated every phase of my being. Africa shall be saved. Africa shall be saved. I woke up and because I've got a German brain I said that's illogical I said Lord my ministry hasn't got an impact here in the small little country and now I hear Africa shall be saved how shall that be you know the Lord gave me a clear answer the following night you know, if you can't talk to us in the day because we are too sharp up here. He talks to us in the night. If he can't find us on our feet, he finds us on our backs. And the Lord gave me an answer the following night by showing me the same dream, the same vision, blood-washed Africa. And I heard the same voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Africa shall be saved. The following night, the same dream. The following night, the same dream. Night after night, the same dream of a blood-washed Africa. And then one morning I said to my wife, I think God is trying to tell me something. <laughs> and I said, oh God, if this is your plan, for Africa to be saved. Help me to connect up with your plan. Because I've learned one thing. If we make our own plans and we pray for God to bless them, He may bless them, He may not bless them. We are never quite sure. But if we link up with His plan, there is no failure. No failure possible no failure possible because God is on the throne he's at the controls of all power the very power of creation hallelujah I say Lord I want I want to go you know as it just happens it just strikes me I have my offices I had there to pay $30 rent a month and we were by faith and I couldn't raise the $30 and the, the rent was due that day. And I sat the whole day behind my writing desk just praying, oh God, I need $30 tonight. I need $30 tonight. I've got to pay the rent. And the money didn't come. Five o'clock came, the money didn't come. And I left the office and I walked to the house that we had rented there with my family. And while I was walking on the street, suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I clearly heard the voice, the, the voice of the Lord speak in my heart. These words, my son.
you want me to give you one million dollar? Wow. It blew my mind. At first I thought, oh Lord, if you give me one million dollar, I can bombard the whole world with the gospel. I know that was foolish, but that I believed then. And while I was still thinking what I could do with one million dollars for Jesus, suddenly another thought struck me. And I stood on the street where people were walking to and fro, and I forgot them. I forgot where I was. I didn't care for anything. I'm not a weepy person at all, but tears streamed down my face. And I lifted my hands, and I cried to God, and I said, No, Lord! I don't want one million dollars! I want much more than that. I said, Lord, give me one million souls. I said, Lord, one million souls less in hell and one million souls more in heaven. That shall be the purpose of my life and ministry. In that moment, I heard the Holy Spirit speak words I'd never heard, I never read. It came straight from heaven. And this is what he said. You shall plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. Hallelujah. And that sums it all up. That sums it all up. Amen. Let's give a hand for Jesus. Glory. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, now I want to hurry up with my report because I've got many things on my heart. You know, we left Lesotho. The Lord said it's time to leave and move into the whole of Africa. I said, okay, Lord, Africa shall be saved. Africa shall be saved. I kept on repeating it all the time. Africa shall be saved. You know, when God speaks to us, it's wonderful to repeat it. Africa shall be saved. Africa, shall, my German missionary colleagues, they said to me, Reinhard, you are crazy. I think, I said to them, I think you got a point. Oh, but Africa shall be saved. Crazy or not crazy, Africa shall be saved. And we left the Sutu, we moved to Johannesburg, into South Africa. When we stopped, we're there in front of that new house with our suitcases, my wife, our three small children. I sat on the suitcase. I will never forget that. And I said, Lord, here I am. On sitting on my suitcases, Africa shall be saved. Africa shall be saved. I don't know how. Don't even know what to do. But Africa shall be saved. The Lord said, take the next plane and go to Botswana. I took the next plane and I went to Botswana. That's another country there. I arrived in Botswana. I didn't even have the money for the cab. I had to walk from the airport to town. Thank God I did. Because there, as I was walking on the street to town, the Holy Spirit caught me again in the middle of the road. The power of God just enveloped me. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, Look to the right side. I said, Lord, it's a stadium. It says there, National Stadium. The Lord said, I want you to preach my word there. A joy flooded my heart. A deep joy. I said, Lord, I always had wanted to preach in a stadium, but the people never came. Now, if you say I'm to preach in the stadium, I just do that. I came to town. I spoke to the local minister who expected me. I had notified him by telephone. I, the first thing after saying good day to him was that I said to him, I want you to help me to secure the national stadium because today in four weeks time, I will come for a gospel crusade. I saw his chin drop. He said, what? Stadium, what do you want the stadium for? Don't you know that I've got 40 people on Sunday in church? He said, no, I didn't know. But I do know that a few minutes ago, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, 
when I put my signature under the contract for the stadium, I started to perspire. I said, oh God, how am I going to fill this place? How am I going to fill this place? Let me cut a long story short. Four weeks later, I arrived. Four weeks later, I arrived with fear and trembling, fasting and praying behind me. I put a small team together, and there I was. And I said, oh Lord, let that stadium be filled the first night, please, just to comfort my worried heart. And the first meeting came, and I waited and waited. I thought the big, big crowd was still arriving, but it was already half an hour after the start, and there were 100 people. I mean 100 people. I counted from right to left, and then from left to right. But 100 is 100. If you count the heads, the heads are not the fingers. But now listen, and this is the crux of the whole matter. The meeting started, I took my Bible and I started to preach. And suddenly something happened. And it still happens today. And it happens here tonight. I preached and suddenly one lady jumped up and shouted, I've just been healed! A second one, a third one, a fourth one. And I said to myself, this is funny. I didn't even preach on healing. You know, I tell you sometimes, Jesus is so itching, he can't wait until we are finished with our sermons. Isn't that so? <laughs> oh, he's the God of action. Hallelujah. I was amazed when I called the people forward to be prayed for by the laying on of hands. I experienced something I'd never be experienced before until then. Everyone we touched passed out. I was shocked. They were, people were lying row for row. I mean row for row. I thought, well, are, they, are they doing as if or are they? I went down and I checked some eyes. I wanted to be sure, but I just saw the white eyeball. I knew they were gone. Somebody came running from the back to the front and said, Reinhardt, I demand an explanation. What about all these unconscious people here? I said, I can't explain. I need an explanation myself. Do you know? He said, no, I don't know. I said, all I can tell you is I didn't ask these people to lie on the floor. I said, we laid hands, we laid hands of, upon these people in the name of Jesus. And I suppose Jesus hands responsible. I'm always glad when I can blame Jesus, you know. <laughs> Listen, one woman was blind and fell down as blind. And when she came up, she saw. And one man went down as a cripple. And when he came up, his legs were straight. And the people began to scream and rejoice and shout. I thought the roof was lifting. And the news spread in Gaborones what Jesus was doing. Miracles. A few days later, for the first time in my life, I stood in front of a packed stadium. For the first time in my life, I tell you, the streets of Gaborones were swept empty of people. And the people were coming. For the first time in my life, I saw thousands of people running forward, weeping under Holy Ghost conviction, receiving Jesus as their Savior. For the first time in my life, one evening, I witnessed a mass outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit. All these people slain in the Spirit within three seconds. If you don't believe it, we've got it on tape. You can see it. Somebody said, where do you find that? The people falling to the ground. I said, well, my Bible says 
that the Holy Spirit will fall on all flesh. If the Holy Spirit doesn't mind falling, I don't mind falling either. <laughs> Amen. Oh, hallelujah. May God have his own way. And his way is always the best way, and I don't care for anything else. When I saw that, mass out, that first mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I tell you, I was shocked. I was shaken. I was shattered. You can call it what you like. I stood there weeping like a little boy crying to God, my God, my God, my God, is this possible? Is this possible? And since that day, it keeps on ringing in my heart day and night. Yes, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And suddenly I could see this is the recipe for Holy Ghost evangelism that will truly save a whole generation. You know, only a mass outpouring of the Spirit of God here upon America will break the devil's back. <laughs> Hallelujah! Just as Africa shall be saved, America shall be saved, and Europe shall be saved, and Asia shall be, shall be saved. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you, that day was really my launching day into this present day ministry. We started then with a tent. We had a tent that's, that could hold 10,000 people that became too small. Then we built the world's biggest tent, seating 34,000 people. It's in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's largest portable structure. But that was just a side issue. That became too small. I tell you, no tent can contain what God is doing. <laughs> Hallelujah. We only pitched that gigantic and expensive tent twice. And that was it. That was it. Some people said after me, said afterwards to me, they said, now, 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 now. Only twice. But I tell you one thing. I said, look, my motive to go through Africa is not display, not to display the latest tent technology. We want to plunder hell and populate heaven. And if there is a tent, puts a limit to that. I want no tent. Today I stand before you and I say with a humble heart, but I say it because it is true. We see nations shaken by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nations from the president downward. Hallelujah. Within 12 months, within 12 months, within 12 consecutive months, months, I had the privilege to preach in Africa to 8 million people face to face. And of these 8 million people, 2 million people responded to the call of salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah! Today, I no more say Africa shall be saved. Today, I say Africa is being saved. He's being saved. God is busy doing it. Glory to God. The church of Jesus Christ is not a pleasure boat. The church of Jesus Christ is a lifeboat. Entertainers are neither needed nor wanted. From the captain to the cook, all hands are needed on deck for soul saving. A church that doesn't seek the lost is lost itself. Hallelujah. I said it so many times in the, in the past months, maybe the past year. Jesus Christ didn't die on Calvary. 
to provide or to yes to provide the clergy with a career Jesus died according to his own words to seek and to save the lost. That is the focus of Calvary. That is the focus of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And he meant it serious because Calvary is serious. Amen. You know, we've got a... a, a a video service that we give to churches that are supporting us and we have do, done it now for a couple of years and then some said oh your videos are always the same Reinhardt always a hundred thousand souls saved and blind eyes open and cripples walk it's always the same you know <laughs> wow it really knocked me I said listen I have a desire to cater for the needs of carnal Christians. Yeah. And I will tell you why. I'm not coming from Hollywood. I'm coming from Calvary. We are not dealing with the rivers of synthetic movie blood that flow from Hollywood. We are dealing with the precious blood of Jesus that he shed on Calvary and that breaks Satan's stranglehold upon humanity. Hallelujah! Say amen. Well, I can tell you, now we see, truly see nations shaken by the power of God. What we saw in the city of Kaduna in Nigeria was amazing. We had up to genuine, my figures are correct. We're not just over the thumb. The local people, they said, you had two million people in one meeting. That was not right. We counted them. There were only 500,000, but they were there. And the local pastors of that city, they said to me, more than 50% of these people in this one meeting, they are Muslims. We saw Muslims receive Jesus Christ as their savior by the tens of thousands. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah! Isn't that fantastic? And the most notable miracles that happened in those meetings, I mean blind eyes open, cripples walking, the most notable miracles happened God did to Muslim people. Isn't that amazing? One rich Muslim afterwards, he took a big sledgehammer, called all his people with their sledgehammers, and he said, come, on my private property, I got a mosque. We will knock it down because Allah has never done anything for me. <laughs> Hallelujah! Isn't that fantastic? I tell you, I was rejoicing! No, Allah changes nothing, whether good or evil. It's all, they always say, Allah has done it, Allah has done it, Allah has done it. I tell you, Jesus came to change everything. <laughs> he said, behold, I make all things new. Now, if you flip through the yellow pages, you find nobody advertising that. <laughs> Isn't that true? Nobody advertises that. Not Buddha said that, not Muhammad said that, not Moses said that, not Elijah said that, not Elisha said it. Nobody, only Jesus. And that's the Jesus we preach. I tell you, when you see half a million people in one, in one meeting, it was absolutely awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And then the Holy Spirit fell. And I tell you, there was a mass outpouring of the Spirit of God. Oh, what a mighty 
mighty privilege to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you, I have ruined my voice. I just am hoarse, like a horse, but I want to preach the gospel to my dying day. Jesus saves. Let me tell you how God affects whole nations. February last year, we went to a small country called Togo in West Africa. Four or five million inhabitants. We were there. And when I arrived there, very, very often when we arrive in a country, we have got a VIP reception, governmental reception. You know, very often I'm getting some, they, 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 the president sends one of his Mercedes-Benz limousines with police outriders, with flashing lights and sirens. Because the gospel is becoming a national event when we come into a country. Isn't that fantastic? That's a privilege. Sometimes we were chased off, out of town. Yeah? But other times we come, I'll tell you, VIPs, very important peanuts. <laughs> Excuse me. So, we had a fabulous arrival there, and before the crusade started, the president uh, uh, invited me just to come for a, you know, just a courtesy call. I went there, I talked, we talked very nicely, I had a word of prayer with him, I said goodbye, and I left. Then the first crusade meeting came, and the miracle power of Jesus was there. Oh, I tell you, there were already, I don't know, about 70, 80,000 people in the first meeting. And when I just prayed one prayer, one prayer for the healing power of Jesus to touch, I tell you, miracles just popped up like popcorn all over, all over, all over. Blind eyes open and blind eyes open and deaf ears and whatnot. Fantastic. And then I received another call from the president's office. The president invited me to come for lunch. I thought it was for a hamburger. I tell you, when I arrived there, it was a state banquet. It was what had been worthy of President Bush. You ask Peter Vandenberg, my right-hand man, it was absolutely fantastic. The president sat on the left side, I next on the, his right, and then the top politicians, you know, the food. I think they had flown it in all the way from France. It was absolutely fantastic. And the president, I tried to tell him what Jesus had been doing in the meetings the previous night. He said to me, Reverend Bonke, you need to tell me nothing. I have a friend of mine. He was stone blind for the last 10 years. Last night, since last night, he can see. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? He said, in my family, there's a little girl that is deaf since last night. She can hear. He looked at me with big eyes. He said, Reverend Pumpkin, never in my life has anybody told me that Jesus Christ is still doing miracles. When we had finished eating, he said, I would like to invite you to come into my most private office. So I left everybody behind, he and his wife and I. In a moment I knew something fantastic would happen. I took my Bible with me. I entered into his office. He said, you know, Reverend Bonk, I've got plenty of offices. He said, this office I only enter when I have got very big problems to solve. That moment the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, your excellency, Mr. President, you may not have noticed it. But when I entered this office, I offered this, entered this office in the company of the one who knows how to solve every problem. And then I preached the gospel to him. And after some minutes, he and his wife received Jesus as their savior. <laughs> Hallelujah.
the crowds were swelling in little Lome, the capital of Togo, up to 200,000 people. I tell you, it's absolutely fantastic. Just to tell you something very more recent. Just about six, seven weeks ago, we went to the, we've got 12 crusades per year in Africa, one a month. We went to the Central African Republic. Again, when we arrived at the airport, what a reception. About 10,000 Christians were there greeting us. I tell you, the presidential limousine was waiting again. The police outriders, everything was there. And then a visit, a courtesy call to the president of the nation. He invited me again privately the following day, just a few weeks ago. Together with my team, and he, we were eating in his place, and I was with him in another room, adjacent room, his wife and his daughter, and there I opened my Bible, I preached the gospel to him, and I was able to lead them, all three of them, to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? The next day, the next day, I received a letter from the Speaker of the House of Parliament inviting me to come and preach and address the House of Parliament. And that wasn't the first time. I think that's the fourth parliament in Africa that I ha have already addressed. And I tell you, when I come to a House of Parliament, there is nothing. We don't, I don't talk about legislation. We are redeemed from the law, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah! Amen! I preach about salvation, real blunt gospel, repentance and faith, and conversion. The first time I preached in the House of Parliament, that was in Malawi. I was a troubled man, you know. But towards the end of my message, all of a sudden I thought by myself, I cannot pretend as though I'm here in, in a crusade meeting. What about protocol? Protocol. The moment the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, he said, no protocol make an altar call. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! I learned my lesson. An altar call is to God a million times more worth than any protocol. Amen. And so I make my altar calls and I have been leading these people to the Lord. It's absolutely fantastic, including the Prime Minister of the Central African Republic and his ministers. They all responded to the call of salvation. Jesus is Lord. Oh, I'm hungry for God's maximum. I'm not satisfied with peanuts. We want those mountains to move in the mighty name of Jesus. Hath he said it, and shall he not do it? I believe we are seeing a blood-washed Africa. One day I had a press conference in Ghana. Press conference in Ghana. And one of the reporters said to me, Oh, Reverend Bond, I felt he had fear in his heart. He said, Have you heard that Colonel Gaddafi from Libya says that he's going to snatch Africa for Islam? I said to him, Sir, Statistics say that if present developments continue at the close of this century, Africa is going to be the most Christian continent on earth. Mr. Gaddafi comes too late. I'm very sorry for him. <laughs> the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I will tell you why Africa belongs by right to Jesus just as much as America Jesus has paid for our continents with his precious blood if you pay for something it's legally yours hallelujah the gospel the preaching of the gospel is a legal act it's a legal act we don't need to do it underground. I don't believe in underground evangelism. When we come to town, it's upper ground all the way. <laughs> Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I hope I'm not boring you with this report. 
Oh, glory to God. I tell you, my heart is rejoicing. My heart is rejoicing. We are moving from country to country. We jump from one place to another. Ah, I have so many things to tell you, but I want to finish now with my report. Let me close like this. I've said, spoken to my team, maybe a bit humorously, yet seriously. I said, one day, when we'll all be in the New Jerusalem, and you don't find me in the city square, I want to tell you already now where you can look for me. I'll be sitting at the pearly gate, watching the pearly gate, because I want to see when Africa is marching in. Hallelujah. And that, that, that procession through the pearly gate may be endless. That's why we trouble ourselves. There's no such as an anointed couch potato. Jesus doesn't anoint us just to be happy and clappy. Jesus anoints us to kick us into gear. The Great Commission and Pentecost are a package deal. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let me just speak about the central theme of any evangelist, all right? And that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. What a wonderful word for the preaching of the cross. Is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let me come straight to the point. You know, one day when I was, I was uh, uh, preaching in... Germany in a, in, a, in a church. I sat there also in the first row waiting for my time to come to preach. And the pastor stood behind the pulpit and was busy with the preliminaries. And behind the platform, behind the pulpit was an ornamental cross, a huge ornamental cross. And I mean, some, something so common, we all know what a cross is and that's it. But while I sat there and I looked at that cross, just looking at that cross, Suddenly, the Holy Spirit touched my eyes. And I saw something I had never seen before. I couldn't believe it. It was so simple, so obvious, yet so profound, yet so powerful and so revolutionary that I was awed. You know, suddenly I realized this. A cross consists of two beams, one in horizontal position and one in vertical position. Now, that beam in the horizontal position, I suddenly saw as the sign that we use at school and in business for a minus. A minus. And that is our part, the human part of the cross of Jesus Christ. We were born with a minus. The Bible has another term for it. The Bible calls it sin. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What does that mean? 
it means that within our hearts the hearts of human beings all over the world no matter what our cultures are no matter what our educational levels are no matter what our mentalities may be all human beings were born with a minus in their lives you could call it deficit you could call it a void you could call it an emptiness you could call it no matter what people are always searching because we were born with a deficit we come short of the glory of God look around right here in Richmond watch where the teenagers go or look into a television sometimes in those talk shows i'm awed to see to what to what uh what shall i say extremities young people go to search for that something that is missing which they cannot even define and therefore they are looking all over for this something and satan uses this search and presents dummies to them poison to them to bind people and to destroy our sons and daughters to destroy fathers and mothers marriages and families completely that minus is there this awful awful minus how many people are going for alcohol to get a little relief uh, you know this I've used this illustration so often but I think it is so typical and so illuminating one drunkard was asked why he was drinking every day and you know what he said I drink because I want to forget my wife he must have had a monster for a wife And then every day he went down the road into the pub, filling himself up, getting drunk, completely drunk, and then walking, staggering back home, completely drunk, opening the door of his house. And what does he see? He sees his wife double. Instead of having to contend with one monster, he now has got two. And by this, I just want to say that alcohol has never yet solved one problem, but it has created and multiplied millions upon millions upon millions. I only know one problem solver. And his name is the name above all name. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And that's exactly what he is doing. Isn't that fantastic? Jesus saves Jesus saves as long as I've got breath within me I want to I want to shout into all the world Jesus 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 saves and Jesus sets free and Jesus satisfies one day I was confronted by a psychologist very highly educated man I've got nothing against education. As a matter of fact, I got a little bit of it myself. <laughs> but that man was an educated fool. Because the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Very simple. He came to me and he said to me, Reverend Bonka, I don't like your method. He said, I'm also a counselor, but I don't like your method. He said, I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. He said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, but I'm also a spiritual counselor. And then I turned 
the spear around. I said, Mister, if you are a spiritual counselor, tell me how do you counsel people? I said, suppose here comes a couple on the point of divorce. His heart is bleeding, her heart is bleeding. They have locked horns. Their marriage is, is completely broken. I said, here comes a couple with bleeding and broken hearts to you for counseling. I said, Mister, tell me, how do you counsel? Do these people come with a bleeding heart? You counsel them and then they go with a bleeding heart? He looked at me and he said, oh no. I just calm them down. I calm them down. The moment the Holy Spirit came over me, I said, Mister! A man on a sinking ship needs more than a tranquilizer. I said, don't calm him down because he's going down already. I said, you know, when Jesus passes such people on a shipwreck, he doesn't come by, throws them a valium and say, hello, perish in peace. I said, mister, I'll tell you what Jesus is doing. When Jesus sees people with bleeding and broken hearts, he reaches down with his nail-pierced hand. He gets hold of them. He lifts them up. He looks into their eyes, and this is his message. He says, I live, and you shall live also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus saves. That must be preached. Jesus is the answer to all those hidden and secret longings of the human soul and of the human heart. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus saves. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now let me hurry up. I promise to be brief. Listen. We can talk about those minuses for ages because it's a big subject. I hate to talk about it, to tell you the truth. Because I've got a better message. I don't go to Africa to tell the people how bad they are. You know what I tell the people in Africa? I say to them, listen, when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come in the uniform of a policeman. Jesus is not stalking us with handcuffs in his pocket. And the moment you do something wrong, he grabs you and he say, I got you. That's not Jesus. Jesus didn't come to arrest us. Jesus came to save us. Jesus didn't come to imprison us. Jesus came to set us free. Yeah. Hallelujah. And my work as an evangelist is not to deliver sermons. I want to deliver people through the power of the gospel and in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Deliver sermons. If a sermon goes to hell, I'm not worried at all. But if a soul goes to hell, I'm all awake. We want soul saved. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay, let me finish with the minus, okay? The minus. The minus. Now listen. If we are all aware of a minus, those that are aware of having a minus in their lives, that deficit in their lives right now, something wonderful took place. You can't believe it. I trust you can. Outside of Jerusalem, on a low hill called Golgotha, or Calvary, the Son of God from heaven crossed through our minus from top to bottom. And when 
then he crossed through our minus. He turned it into a plus. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the meaning of the cross. The Romans thought it was a gallow for the purpose of executing criminals. But the cross is God's plus factor for a lost humanity. Hallelujah. Let me wrap it up like this. Jesus came into this world to turn a minus into a plus. To turn negative into positive. To turn night into light. To turn death into life. To turn hell into heaven. To turn hate into love. To turn sickness into health. And failure into success. It is the cross of Calvary. If God be for us, who can be against us? Give a hand for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? This is the greatest message I know. That's why Paul said, I preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead. It's the very, very axis of the gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ. And if that cross is not in the center, what the message would be out of balance altogether. The cross of Jesus Christ is so profound, so fantastic, so great. Isn't that marvelous? I tell you, Jesus is here to set people free. Jesus is here to set people free. Amen. Jesus is here to cross through your minus no matter what it is. And instead of divorcing your husband, you're going to have a new honeymoon. And you will repeat your marriage vows tonight. Amen. Jesus makes all things new. Oh, I tell you, I feel such a powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit here. You preach cr the cross of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is there, right there. And he bears witness. Isn't that true? This is true. Glory to God. People are set free. You know, fear is turned into joy. Depression is turned into rejoicings. One psychiatrist said to me, he said, Reverend Bonke, do you know that there's a difference between real fear and imagined fear? I said, is there a difference in the amount of pain people suffer? No, 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 he said, that, that's the same. I said, well, what, what's the use of talking about it? What's the use? One day I think I met a lady that had imagined fear. She came to me after a meeting. I think she had never been in such a meeting. And she came weeping and she said, Preacher, preacher, I'm addicted to Valium. I can't sleep without Valium anymore. You know, the moment I've, the Holy Spirit touched my heart and I said to her, Tell me, lady, why can't you sleep at night? She said to me, I can't sleep because the dog is barking every night. A moment. I said to her, lady, if I were you, I would give the volume to the dog. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against animals. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. If I couldn't sleep because the dog is barking, I would make sure that Snoopy sleeps well.
Amen. But now, whether the fear is imagined or whether the fear is real, what does it matter? Jesus breaks all the bondages of Satan. And even if you can't define your fear, Jesus delivers from all mysterious diseases, from all mysterious bondages and fears. Hallelujah. And it's going to happen here tonight. And it's going to happen here tonight. I know it. Now, before, before I finish with this message on the cross, I've got one more thing. Can you give me two more minutes? If you don't enjoy my preaching, I enjoy it myself. I want to give you a lesson in divine arithmetic. How many of you want to know how God is doing his arithmetic? Aha. This is how he does it. I alone am lost. Or you, anyone. But I plus, that's the cross, Jesus equals a child of God. Hallelujah. Let me give you one more illustration. I alone am weak. But I plus, that's the cross, Jesus equals more than a conqueror. Yeah. Hallelujah. Isn't that fantastic? The secret is not in us or by anything that we can, that we can crank up ourselves. The secret is that God crossed through our minus and turned it into a plus and by doing so added Jesus to us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And God is before us in Jesus Christ the Son. Isn't that marvelous? Oh, hallelujah. I tell you here, any type of bondage, any type of fear, any type of sin, any type of disease, Jesus is here to cross through it right now. But you must come. You must come. In Jesus' name, you must come. And having Jesus added to you is absolutely fantastic because then we are condemned to victory. Is that right? Is that right? You know, I've been reminded just these last few, three days of something that happened to me. I want to close with this. I was too wonderful. I was on a national television, secular television, invited to participate in a panel discussion on religious uh, questions. When I arrived there, the program said religious experts discuss religion, religious questions. And when I arrived there, to my big surprise, the other party, the other, other chap who was invited was an atheist. I thought he was a funny expert on religious questions. But I mean, I didn't even know him. Uh, he was bragging about his atheism. You know, my definition for atheism is this. It's intellectual vandalism. So, this atheist there, I don't know what happened. I think I will never know. But when we were in that discussion, suddenly the theme of horse racing came up. Horse racing. Now, that was a subject I knew absolutely nothing about. But that atheist was an expert. 
He knew all the horses, the names of the horses. He knew all the names of the jockeys. He was, his eyes were glowing when he spoke about betting and gambling and horse racing. Oh, he was in shape, I tell you. He said, I put all my money on that and that horse. And I was sitting on the other end and I closed my eyes only half. I didn't want to appear sleeping. But I just prayed in my heart. I said, oh God, when my turn comes, Holy Spirit, give me punching power. I must confess, I like a good fight for Jesus. It's very enjoyable. And while he was keep picking, speaking on horses, 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 suddenly the Holy Spirit just whoo, came over me and I woke up. And I turned to that atheist, I looked into his eyes, I said, Mister, now I want to tell you something about horses. He was surprised. What does the preacher know about horses? I said, Mister, you told us on which horse you've put your money. I want to tell you on which horse I've put my money. I put my money on the white horse in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Hallelujah! That atheist was puzzled and buffered. He scratched his head. He repeated, white horse in the book of Revelation? You know that was the only horse that horse expert had never heard anything about. I felt so sorry for him. And then that atheist made his second mistake. He said to me, preacher, tell me who is the rider on that horse? wanted to know who the jockey was. I said to him, Mister, the book of Revelation chapter 19 says, the rider's name is faithful and true. He is the Son of God. His name is Jesus Christ. He said, I said to him, Mister, I want to be honest with you. I didn't put my money on him because I got no money. But I put my life and my soul on him and I know I'm going to win! Yeah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! When we left the studio, that atheist came following me. <laughs> Put me by my jacket, he said to me, tell me, how does one become a Christian? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, the cross of Calvary adds Jesus to you. And tonight you will never be lonely again, never be fearful again. The power of Jesus the hand of the Almighty God. He upholds you with the right hand of His righteousness. And you will be safe and secure, washed in the blood of Jesus. A life completely changed. I feel Jesus is here right now. I want to pray for the sick here tonight. But before I do that, let's close our eyes. Before I do that, I first want to pray for those who need washing from sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, you need Jesus to cross through your minus and turn it into a plus. You want that Jesus is added to you and to your life. Maybe you are a backslider. I want you tonight to slide back to Jesus. Come back 
to Jesus. He's here to save you mightily and gloriously. Hallelujah. Who's here tonight who says, yes, I want Jesus to cross through my minus now. I want him to forgive my sins. I want Jesus to change everything in my life. Then I want to pray for you right now. First of all, in preparation for that, what Jesus is going to do beside this. Just lift your hand as a sign that I can see it and pray for you. Just lift your hand if you want Jesus to cross through your minus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Here, lift your hand. I want to acknowledge that. Thank you. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here in the middle block. Yes, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well. I see so many hands. God bless you. This is the day of salvation. Over there, here at the front, there at the back, in the middle. People all over responding to the wonderful gospel of Jesus. Oh, hundreds of millions of people all over the world have experienced the very truth of it. And now it's your turn in Jesus' name. If you've got a broken marriage, a broken family, because sin has entered, Jesus is here to forgive you, to cleanse you, to give you a brand new start. Listen, he's not here to calm you down. People on a sinking ship don't need to be calmed down. A man on a sinking ship needs rescue. And the Son of Man has come to seek and rescue, to seek and save those people. And he's here to do it now. I feel Jesus is right here in front waiting for you. I'm asking everybody to stand and those who lifted their hands because you want Jesus to cross through your minds. Come quickly forward. I want to shake your hand and I want to pray with you right now. This is the moment of decision. Come right now while we sing, He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and He is Lord. We sing it as a prayer. All of you who lifted their hands, just come. I would like to shake your hand and I want to pray for you. Jesus will do it. What must we do to be saved? He that who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God said it. And when he says shall be, then you will be. When he says shall be, you will be if you do what he told you to do. Now we will call on the name of the Lord in prayer. And that moment the miracle of all miracles happens. Jesus crosses through your minus, turns it into a plus. And your darkness will have turned into light. And your bondage into freedom. Your hate into love. Hallelujah. This is the power of God in action. Please close your eyes. And if you can manage, lift your hands to heaven. Shall we do it all, all together? I'm asking everybody to repeat this prayer of salvation in support of those who pray it here in front. Pray it from the bottom of your heart. Now is the moment of salvation. Let's pray. Say, Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I have heard the good news and present my minus to you. All my sins and my sorrow my burdens and my diseases, my failure, I present it to you. I repent of my sins. I now call upon your name. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Save my soul now. Save my soul now. I now believe with my heart. What I speak with my mouth. Jesus Christ is now my Savior. He has crossed through my minus. He has turned it into a plus. I'm a child of God. I believe it. I receive it. I confess it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I pray that you may now put the witness into the hearts of all these dear people that they are indeed children of the Most High God. I bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that Satan's works are destroyed. And I thank you, Lord, that you have made all things new. From top to bottom, spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>got a message on my heart which the Lord laid upon my heart I want to speak to you this morning about the overcomers how many of you are overcomers and how many of you want to be overcomers amen hallelujah glory to God glory to God I want to turn to a scripture from Revelation chapter 19 I, I do not really enter all the profes- prophetic aspects of this chapter. That would be, that would be uh, a tremendously involved, although it would be terrific. But I'm just taking a couple of verses here to highlight the overcomers. And we start with verse 1, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 8. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, or clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And verse 9, and he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Hallelujah. And I will have a couple of more scriptures. Um, Revelation chapter 3 verse 21, to him who overcomes... I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What fantastic prospects. Oh, that will be glory for me. Amen. Amen. Now in this chapter, I find a couple of very interesting points and I want to highlight some of them. Number one, in verse one, we read about the song of the overcomers. The overcomers have a wonderful song. I already, my ears picked up the song of the overcomers here this morning. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Now, what is the song of the overcomers? After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven singing, singing. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. 
the overcomers are hallelujah people yes. isn't that true yes. and hallelujah means praise the lord yes. praise the lord and this is also the proof that the hallelujah is not just a religious word on earth. It's a heavenly word. It came from heaven down to earth. And we will take it with us from the earth back to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, I come from a country where people take offense because I shout hallelujah so much. <laughs> Especially the religious type of people. If you want to shock the German people, you don't need to commit murder. <laughs> that shocks nobody. But if you shout hallelujah in church, <laughs> the shock wave goes through the whole nation, the united <laughs> Germany. From north to south and east to west, they turn around and say, Here you dare to shout, Hallelujah! Yes, I do, because I am an overcomer in the name of the Lord! Hallelujah! Amen! The song of the overcomer is Hallelujah! I sometimes wondered why the Bible says in Revelation that in heaven is going to be half an hour of silence. I think that's the half an hour when the German Christians march in. <laughs> but not when the Welsh Christians march in. <laughs> hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! Glory to God! I said to my team many times, you know, when one day when you arrive in heaven and you don't find Reinhard Bonke in the city square of the New Jerusalem, I want to tell you already now where I am, you'll find me at the pearly gate. Because I want to see when Africa is marching in. Oh, hallelujah! And I pray that that procession may never end. That's why we are working so hard. Preaching the gospel! Africa will march in. I want to march in under Africa's flag. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Their song was hallelujah. And if you're not used to it, you get a bit used to it here. Otherwise, you'll get a heart attack in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Oh, you better get used to it. I mean, I want to get used to heaven on earth. Yeah. And not fall from the chair up there. <laughs> because there, my Bible says they are going to sing. sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory and honor and power be unto him, our Lord and God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I, have, I, I just can't help myself but shout and praise God. I want to shout. I preach with emphasis. I learned that in Wales. <laughs> preach with emphasis. If you've got to say something, then say it with conviction. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And I know that my Redeemer lives. Yes. That's not a hope, that's an assurance. Yes. That's not faith, that is knowledge. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise be to God. And you know, when I see how Satan rapes humanity, when I see how Satan binds and torments humanity, I cannot coo like a dove. You know, we are far too kind with all these forces that destroy humanity. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to crush the head of the serpent. That was not just having a nice church service. That was war. Yes. Yes. And that is war. Yes. Yes. The overcomers have got a song, and that song is Hallelujah. 
salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. I maintain that this is proper worship. What is worship? Worship is when we give to God what belongs to God. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. And thine, and thine, and thine alone. And when we give to God what belongs to God, then God gives to us what he has promised to us. And if that is true, then it is also true that the hallelujahs belong to God. Amen? I learned that from this very verse. Not just the power belongs to God, not just the honor belongs to God, not just the glory belongs to God and salvation belongs to God, but also the hallelujahs. So, don't keep God's property. Give to God what belongs to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We give to God what belongs to God. Amen! And if there's only one hallelujah left in you, give it to God! To shout hallelujah here must be the most natural thing. As I already said, what is allowed in heaven cannot be prohibited in Newport. Hallelujah! is to give to God what belongs to God. Say amen. amen. That's why we give to him constantly. And then God gives to us also constantly. Amen. amen. There's power in worship. Yes. Just remember Jehoshaphat. Power in worship. How he put the singers and the worshipers in front of the soldiers. Oh, I love that. I love that. And when they began to praise and worship the Lord, the enemy was routed, beaten. Victory was theirs. They overcame by praising Jehovah. Oh, the lamb on the throne, the lamb on the throne. Amen. So the song of the overcomers, if you haven't got that hallelujah song, get it today. But that is only one part. Now let me go on. In verse 8, we read something about the dress of the overcomers. The song in verse 1 and the garment or the dress in verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white or bright. The old King James says white. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Hallelujah. Now we read something about the dress of the overcomers. God is dressing the overcomers. Isn't that true? And the garments, well, you know, I would like to know much more about the cut of this garment. I would like to know something about the style and the size and the length and, no, and, and, and who knows what. But it doesn't give us any details except one and th that detail is absolutely important. It says that those fine linen are clean and white, clean and white. God's overcomers are clean and white and bright. Say amen. amen. We were made our garments white in the blood of the Lamb. That's why Jesus had to die for us to be clean and bright and white. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes whiter than the snow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And another scripture speaks of us having to be without spots and without wrinkles. In other words, we need a washing and we need an ironing. 
Many are washed, but still not ironed. Amen. Amen. Yes, you don't really live in sin, but you have got pro cause problems all the time. You need a hot iron. To get rid of all the wrinkles. Amen. Amen. Clean and wipe the dress of the overcomers. This is very important. I believe it is so essential to live a holy life in an unholy environment. We've got to live a clean and a holy life. Without sanctification, we cannot see God. This is a fact. This is a scriptural fact. And I know that this theme is not, not much preached about anymore, but it still is a biblical fact that we've got to live a clean and a holy life. If you agree, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And I also know one thing, the more we have fellowship with Jesus, and the more we have of the Holy Spirit, the holier our lifestyle will be. You know, once, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit thinking about my, my younger years. I once attended the, uh, the, 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 the Missions Academy of the uh, 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 State Church in Germany. <coughs> and there was the professor and there were students. And we sat around that we sat around that table and we dis were discussing things and it was very interesting it was extremely interesting we were talking about the prophet zachariah and zachariah said there that uh, the day would come when in israel they would write on, on on pots and on everything they would write these words holy unto the lord and we were discussing scripture there and these Lutherans while they were discussing scriptures profoundly they were smoking their cigars and I sat there you know and that that old smoke was so t awful to me but I tell you the comments on that scripture were so brilliant and everybody had to give had to give a comment on that scripture and then my turn came and I said mr. professor I haven't got a contribution as such I only got a question I said if Israel was able to write on everything these words holy unto the Lord I would like to ask you if you can write holy unto the Lord on your cigar Amen. Everybody cracked up in laughter. And they thought this was the biggest joke of the day. And one of these men said, well, they said, Reinhardt. Every morning when I say grace at the breakfast table, I include my good cigars. And I thought to myself, how was it possible that this man could speak like that? And then I knew it. This man could speak like that because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you cannot say that you write holy on something unholy without the Holy Spirit punishing you inside. Amen. Amen. Church of Jesus Christ, it's wonderful to praise the Lord in worship. But there's something more than that. Have a garment and wear it day in and day out that is clean and white and bright and without wrinkles. Give a hand for Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's his attribute. Holiness is his attribute. Amen. The dress of the overcomers. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we've seen the song of the overcomers. We've seen the dress of the overcomers. Now let's come to verse 9. 
and there we read about the food of the overcomers. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Oh, hallelujah. Now here we've got the food of the overcomers. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper, supper, supper of the Lamb. There's something to be eaten, not only, but also. Amen? Amen. So there's food for the overcomers. You know, I once was blessed and puzzled and blessed again by a scripture. Let me quickly turn to it because it just is very closely knitted together. Revelation 3.20 this time. Here we read, it's an... Actually, you know, I've, I'm preaching on this scripture evangelistically, normally. But listen to this. Verse 20 says, Behold, Jesus is speaking here, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And for many years I thought, now, why on earth did Jesus say, you know, every word counts in Scripture. How many of you know that? Amen. You see, the Bible was written, I would say, in a, in a telegram style. So, we are given only what we really need to know. And every word that is in this word here in the Bible is crucial and is important. And I said to myself, now, isn't this here, a, 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 is this maybe a poetic repetition, I thought, when it says here, I will come into him and will eat with him and he with me. I said, well, it's, isn't, that quite, isn't that quite logical that when we eat together, then I eat with you and you eat with me? Is this maybe poetry here? What is the real meaning? But I tell you one thing. Every time something doesn't click, there is a profound secret there, isn't it? And we need the Holy Spirit to unlock it and to unreal, un uh, reveal it. And all of a sudden, I saw something I had never, never known before. When Jesus says, I will come to into him and eat with him and he with me, there's one difference. There's one difference. When Jesus says, I will eat with him, then it means that we are the host. And when he says, you will eat with me, then he is the host. The host changes. Do you get it? I say it once again. Jesus says, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. When we eat with Jesus, Jesus is the host. When Jesus eats with us, we are the host. And I said to myself, wow, if Jesus is the host, I know what he's going to dish up. Have a guess. He says, this is my body that was broken for you. And we eat the broken bread in remembrance of his broken body. And we drink the wine in remembrance of his shed blood. Hallelujah. That's what we eat when Jesus is the host. Then I thought, wow. Now, when I am the host, what have I to dish up? And I went into my pantry and I checked everywhere what I could possibly provide when I am the host and Jesus eats with me and I had a big struggle. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit helped me again. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Shall I tell you what I would dish up? 
Hello. Yes. Are you all there? Yes. I'll tell you what I would dish up. I think if I may say this, Jesus is possibly a vegetarian. I think Galatians 5.22 gave me the right clue. There we read about the fruit of the Spirit. Say amen. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in my life which he made to grow by his grace and by his mercy the ripe fruit of the spirit i would take and i would put it on the table i say lord here it is now let's dine together amen, amen. hallelujah amen. glory to god in the highest now, what is, the, what is the food of the overcomers? I'll tell you what the food of the overcomers is. The food of the overcomers, in another sense, is the word of God. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, a bee, for instance, where does the bee collect the honey from? From the garbage dump? From the dunghill? Well, I wouldn't want to eat that honey. <laughs> huh? We wouldn't want that. No, the bee despises the dunghill. Thank God. And the bee goes for the bloom of the flower. And it gets to the pure nectar. You spoke of it this morning. The pure nectar of the flower. The, there's only one pure flower in this world. And that is the word of God. You won't get that honey from the worldly media. You won't get the honey from the newspapers and the magazines. But we get the honey from the word of God. There's honey in the rock, my brother. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that is the food of the overcomers. Amen. That is the food of the overcomers. We need to live from the word. Say amen. amen. The word, the word. And again, the word. That's the whole secret. The entrance of your word bringeth light. Yes. And we live in a filthy world. A world in which it is not easy to stay clean and holy. But I tell you, the word of God is something like a repellent. That filth cannot even touch us. It's repelled before it grips us. Say amen. amen. And the word of God is that washing of the word, that constant washing of the word. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. It's food. It's protection. It's light. It's health. It's peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, glory to God. I'm getting blessed here myself this morning. You know, some people misunderstand everything. I heard one day one brother say, I'm standing on the word of God. And you know, in order to prove it, he took his Bible and he put it on the floor and he stood on it. <laughs> now, well, this simple soul, I, I, I forgave him. It's okay. Maybe he meant it well. But I had the feeling he was just a, somebody who always liked arguments and who, you know, he didn't mind to lose a soul as long as he won an argument. Don't like such people and then it came to my mind what's the difference between a pole and a tree you know a pole that is cemented into the ground stands firmly is that right i mean it stands let storms come and that pole will stand it won't even it won't even sway it will just stand because it was concreted into the ground it's a pole 
But a tree is different. A tree is different. And I want to tell you the difference between a pole and a tree. The pole stands on the ground. And the tree lives from the ground. That is the difference. I don't just want to stand on the word and argue about it. I want to live from the word and proclaim it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This is the food of the overcomers here on earth. And that will give them the energy they need to fight the good fight with all their might in the name of Jesus. Say amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, I told you about the song. I spoke about the dress, the garment, and I spoke about the food of the overcomers. Now, let me add one more thing. One more thing, okay? I already have turned my Bible to Revelation chapter 3. There is even something greater. <coughs> 321. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Hallelujah. I believe that that is the throne or that is the pinnacle for the overcomers. Jesus said he that overcomes, I will make to sit with me on my throne. Can you imagine that? Jesus sharing his throne with those who overcame on earth. Isn't that, isn't that thought? Isn't that, that truth dazzles me. And I say to myself, oh, what is heaven going to be? Now let me quickly chip in something. I feel I must chip that in very quickly. Do you know why these people are called overcomers in heaven? I tell you. They are only called overcomers in heaven because they overcame on earth. You see, what matters here today, what matters this week, right here in Newport, or wherever you are, is going to be reflected up there one day. You see, there is nothing to overcome in heaven. They are not called overcomers in heaven because it's easy to overcome in heaven. They are called overcomers in heaven. Sitting, sharing the throne of Jesus because they overcame in Wales and they overcame in Germany and they overcame here while the heat was on and Satan was buffeting them. Amen. And that's why I've got such an urge in my heart here this morning and I say, come on, don't fool yourself. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to be sure that we are living a clean and a holy life. We've got to make sure that we take into ourselves these holy energies from the word of God that will enable us to truly overcome. Hallelujah. Amen. So, we are overcomers in heaven only because we overcame here on earth and Jesus says you will sit with me you will sit with me you will sit with me lift your hand and say amen, amen. you will sit with me you will sit with me you will sit with me amen you know what puzzles me is one other thing John and James John and James in Luke 22, John and James, we belittle them, we look down on them, we despise them because they had wanted to sit on thrones to the left side and to the right side of Jesus. 
But I tell you one thing. I got the scripture right here. I tell you one thing. This was the fault of their virtue. Hello. This was the fault of their virtue. And why? You know, these disciples were simple fishermen. They would have never left. They would have never left a radius of 100 miles in Israel. Throughout their lives, they were just fishing and, and having a family and living and dying right there at the Sea of Galilee. That would have been their, that would have been their destiny. What happened? Jesus cut across their path. And he just spoke a few words and all of a sudden their hearts were set on fire. And their lives completely changed. Amen. And what did Jesus say to them? Luke 22, 29. And I bestow upon you a kingdom. Just as my father bestowed one upon me. Now listen. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones yes, judging the 12 tribes of Israel yes, I when I go to heaven I'm going to congratulate John and James for having had such an idea because that idea was put into their heads by Jesus himself Hallelujah! He said, you are going to sit on thrones. And they said, all right, Lord, so be it. I left, he right. What about that? I think Jesus must have smiled. The others rebuked them, but Jesus must have smiled. I tell you, Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Shall I tell you something? This means that Jesus didn't come to dig us in. He came to dig us out. Amen. Yes, amen. You see, Jesus took, took, took the, 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 the vista of these men that was just directed downward. And the moment they met him, their vista was directed upwards. They were just looking and watching for fish and could hardly find it. And all of a sudden, they looked up and say, they saw thrones. 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 Hallelujah. Overcomers. We shall overcome in the name of Jesus and by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus didn't come to dig us in. Some people think so. Christianity doesn't bury us. We are not buried. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And I tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're not go going to be like a mousy, like a mousy person. Twittering like a little mouse. Always afraid to be hypnotized by some snake somewhere. I tell you, I tell you one thing. Amen. We are not running away from snakes. We are hunting them. In the name of Jesus, we are hunting them. Amen. I, for my part, forever enjoyed that scripture which says that Jesus said, I send you like sheep among the wolves. I was puzzled for a long time until one day I realized, hey, the sheep are on the attack. The sheep are on the attack. And the wolves are put to flight. One man with God. One woman with God. Shall chase 10,000. In Jesus name. You see this is when Jesus comes. Overcomers. 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 In Jesus' name. Amen. Check your song. And check your garment. And check your food. Check it. And see whether it's running in conformity with the word of God. 
and if not I would pull up my socks or you should rather pull up your stockings <laughs> but you should do something so that one day you will really have joined the overcomers up there in Jesus wonderful and glorious name hallelujah hallelujah oh hallelujah I feel in my heart this morning one thing that Jesus is here to help some people with some very deep problems and secret problems and secret uncleannesses and spots that are hidden they are not seen in church but maybe they are seen in the middle of the week when you go to a certain place or what Jesus is here to cleanse you Jesus is here to put this song into your mouth and Jesus is here to plant you he will develop an appetite for the word of God that it will be insatiable amen, amen. glory to God you know one little ex I, I, I when I was in South Africa I heard one little story that just comes to my mind now strange uh, let me quickly tell you I heard that there in the free state in South Africa there was a farmer who had a very strange pet that pet was a vulture and that vulture was chained to a tree in the yard and you know vultures are very restless birds they're not meant to be chained and that vulture for years being chained to that tree had been running around that tree and he had trodden out a path you know where, had, where that thing had been running there was a real street because he was going there every day a hundred times or more one day the, after years the farmer said I feel sorry for that poor thing I'm going to release it and he, and he took pliers and he cut the chain and he chased that vulture away and there the vulture flew off next morning at breakfast when the farmer looked out of his window he wiped his eyes the vulture was back walking around that tree the chain was away from its foot but the chain was still in its brain the chain was still in the brain and although it had no real chain it was compelled to come back to that old routine I feel this morning something is going to happen chains are going to be cut and you're going to spread your wings and you will never re return to that tree of defeat or to the tree of addiction or to the tree of sin or to the tree of unclean habits in the name of Jesus Christ the Son of God you shall overcome Jesus made overcoming possible for us here right here and then the celebration is up there but here we have to overcome amen Amen. Amen. You're going to be set free. Your wings will be spread out and you will rise. You will rise like an eagle in the wonderful name of Jesus. And then your hallelujahs will have a meaning they never had before. Say amen. amen. Your hallelujahs will have a meaning they never had before because they come from a different kind of heart and a different kind of life and lifestyle. Hallelujah! hallelujah. You know, I sometimes can hear when people just shout hallelujah and they are empty. They are awful. They are really awful. Empty hallelujahs are awful. But if a hallelujah is connected with an overcomer, oh, 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 oh. The angels stop singing in heaven. They want to hear that symphony of hallelujahs coming from, from the kitchen. 
somewhere in Newport. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Or from the offices, or from the workshops, or from the schools, or from the universities. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I challenge you, dear Welsh people in Jesus' name. I challenge you. Just make your checks. Some dress, food, and the end. Make your checks. And the Holy Spirit will lead you into new dimensions. Forthwith. 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 Amen. Forthwith. Glory to God in the highest. I had that message on my heart here this morning. I'm sure that this is a word from God for you. And I believe, I believe you will remember this as well. And I believe the Holy Spirit will keep on reminding you of it. And one day maybe in heaven we'll shake hands and you will say, Remember that day I took my checklist and I found I needed help. And that day God did it. I'm among the overcomers today. Glory to God, overcomers in heaven were those who overcame on earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. I once met a woman. She told me that for the split of a second, she saw the face of Jesus. She was weeping. When she spoke about it, you know, she looked almost like glorified. And I could see that she had seen something. And she said, all my pains, all my trials, all my worries throughout my life here in this world were worth it all. When I saw the face of Jesus for the split of a second, the moment it struck me, and I thought, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. There will only be one never-ending sensation in heaven, and that never-ending sensation is this. Jesus, 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 the Lamb upon the throne. Hallelujah. And I think the Lord puts this vista before our eyes so that we will be spurned on and that we say, yes, Lord, I want to run this race. I want to finish it. And I want to complete it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to do this, what I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to do right now. Let's close our eyes in the presence of God. The spotlight of God is directed towards everyone here this morning. We are standing in his light and we can see the truth. I just want to do one thing. The Holy Spirit tells me here are people who say, Oh God, my garment is spotted with sin. My garment is spotted with sin. I need cleansing through the precious blood of Jesus. I want to belong to those immaculate overcomers in heaven. They are not immaculate because of their own righteousness. They are immaculate because they were washed in the blood of Jesus. And that is available to you right now. Who is here this morning who says, Lord, my garment is spotted. But now I want to make it white and bright through the precious blood 
of the Lamb of God. Then I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand where you are. Let Jesus see your hand. If you need cleansing from sin through the precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we sing that song, Oh, the blood of Jesus? Let's all stand. I want those who need cleansing from sin through the blood of Jesus. Just come, come forward. I want to pray with you right here. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white than the snow. Sing it from the bottom of your heart. Oh, says the chain is off your foot otherwise you wouldn't be in church this morning but I will do more than that I will break the chain in your brain I will set your mind free from all uncleanness and from impure images and I will break those evil lusts that hunt you and haunt you and I will create a new heart within you said the Lord and I will put a new spirit within you said the Lord and you will remember this day as the day that you set your foot into the territory of the overcomers in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name let's all lift our hands to heaven I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me in support of those who pray it here in front say dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus you died on the cross for me You shed your precious blood for me. You shed your precious blood for me. I bring my spotted garments to you. I bring my spotted garments to you. Wash and cleanse me now. Wash, Wash and cleanse me now. And deliver me from all evil. And deliver me from all evil. I call upon your name. I call upon your name. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Son of God. Son of God. I want to be an overcomer. 
I want to be an overcomer. I will be an overcomer. I will be an overcomer. By your grace. By your grace. And in your power. And in your power. I believe it. I believe it. I receive it. I receive it. And I thank you for it. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I now break every chain. And in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you are delivering everyone from that old rat of sin. That old rat of sin. That old habit of sin. In the name of Jesus, strongholds are pulled down. All unclean images are destroyed in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you may fill every heart and mind with the beauty of Jesus. And I thank you that we are pure and spotless and without wrinkles because of that what you did in our lives in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name I I have such a rejoicing in my spirit right now let's rejoice for a moment come on have you got a good rejoice I mean this is the rejoicing church hallelujah come on we more than conquerors amen His will in us. He said that he would guide us with his power. Yes, sir. church at this time is of more value to God than it was before 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 say amen. amen look at all these precious precious 
people here in front who are washed in the blood of the Lamb and who are spotless and clean in Jesus' name. Their hallelujahs have got a different meaning right now. Right now. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's have a hallelujah festival. One moment. The Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord is here to break more chains, even chains of diseases right now. Chains of diseases. Satan has no right to put diseases upon you if it says clear and distinctly in the Bible that by his stripes we are healed. We come against this illegal act of Satan. Amen. In the mighty name of the Lord. If you're sick, lift your hand. We're going to break those chains right now. And you will leave that tree of disease. Amen. Because we are now throwing all our diseases upon the tree that was planted at Calvary. Hallelujah. Oh, cast all your care upon him. And I believe Jesus is going to heal right now. Some will be spectacular. Some will not be outwardly so spectacular. But Jesus will do it right now. Close your eyes. I'm going to come and lay my hands on you. And the power of God is going to strike you like lightning here this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you from the bottom of my heart that Satan can put nothing illegal upon your children. You came to destroy the works of the devil. And sickness is not a work of God. Lord, you came to destroy these works. And I thank you that it happens right now in Jesus' name. 